Greetings. One of the opportunities of uh, live, many opportunities of living in Central Florida is we uh, are able to go out and watch these. Uh, I can uh, I can go out as I did last evening uh, as the Sabbath began. We were able to go out into the backyard and watch a rocket being launched from uh, Kennedy Space Center. You know, as I said, it's. Uh, I, I, so I think of uh, Florida as a kind of a Tomorrowland. We're we're kind of at the edge of, uh, of the of the uh, let's call it the space race or the opportunity to try to explore uh, beyond our our atmosphere, so to speak. Now there was a, a man who uh, had a friend who was an astronaut, and he went down to Kennedy Space Center to visit him, but uh, he wasn't able to see him. It seems like the fellow was out to launch. I <laughs> uh, hope you like that story. Last week I spoke about the career of Joshua, and I could have said a lot more, but it's uh, in reflecting back on on, on it, uh, it, those what I read in Joshua twenty four were were pretty much his last words to his people, and he probably died shortly thereafter, just as Moses gave a final warning to his people and died shortly thereafter. But you know, in spite of the warnings of Moses, in spite of the warnings of Joshua, uh, Israel did not live up to its commitments as we, as we well know. And so the Northern Kingdom disappeared. The Southern Kingdom of Judah survived, but uh, it was uh, exiled by the Babylonians and uh, therefore the Jews were scattered in the, uh, in the Middle East initially and of course later on worldwide. But uh, at the time of, uh, towards the end of the Old Testament period, we do find a remnant returning under the Medo-Persian Empire and we find in Ezra 6 uh, that there, the temple is being rebuilt. And then in the seventh chapter, we find that Ezra returns or, or to the Holy Land uh, and, and helps get things uh, back on track there. But between Ezra 6 and 7, there are very important events that are covered in what, what we call the diaspora, uh, critical events in the history of, uh, of the Jewish people, in the history of God's church, because the Jews were God's church of that day. And the bulk of them at that time were living in Iraq and Iran, what we call today Iraq and Iran. You know, uh, Babylonia and uh, and Persia, uh, and in that area, a very uh, important series of events occurred, which led to the celebration of the holiday of Purim, and I call this talk anticipating Purim. Purim is coming up uh, very soon as I speak. I'm speaking at that season of the year, uh, and uh, this year was in Turkulary, so we have a thirteenth month. Uh, normally there would be twelve. Uh, times there are 13 to keep the holy days in the in their proper season this is one of those intercalary years so th but this is a time of joy the saying is mishinich nas adar marbim bishimcha you know when when the month of adar enters our our joy in, increases unfortunately this this year as i'm speaking uh it's a very serious time uh even though purim is coming up but we all know if, if you're if you're listening to me at the time of the recording, around that time, it's a very serious time. We have war in the Middle East, and uh, well, a lot of turmoil in the world in general, and uh, tensions between the United States and Israel, and so on. So it's it's a very rough period, and so it's important for us to remember that God is ultimately directing world events. Things are going to ultimately work out uh, for the best for human beings because God is in control. He, he, he is working out events and there is a, a divine providence. Uh, we, don't, we don't always, we're, we're not always directly aware of it, but, but it's, a, it's a reality. You know, if, in America, Amer uh, the, the early colonists were very well aware of that. We have one of the capitals of, of uh, the, uh, one of the 13 colonies all the way back in 1636, Roger Williams established Rhode, uh, what we call today Rhode Island, and the ca capital was Providence. If you look at the back of a dollar bill, you see a pyramid with an eye, and um, indicating divine providence. And 
there's a, a, a saying there with 13 letters for the 13 states that originally began the country. And I believe that the translation of that is, he has favored our beginning. Uh, and and uh, indeed, God had, in effect, in, uh, intervened so that although it was, it was difficult, history is difficult, history is messy, but the colonists did establish a separate state, which I believe uh, was, was part of, 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 uh, of a prophecy that I would go into at another time. But uh, our founding fathers of this country, uh, and mothers for that matter, were aware of, of divine providence. And that is a very important factor uh, that, we, re that we, can, we can see in the book of Esther. Now, Purim is a Jewish holiday, uh, so Jews ought to be observing it. Uh, it is not commanded upon the entire Christian commandment-keeping community. Uh, it is not one of the appointed times of Leviticus 23. Uh, but I would recommend for a commandment-keeping Christian, if you are not Jewish, I'd still recommend that about a month before the Days of Unleavened Bread, before the Passover season, that about a month before you go ahead and read the book of Esther, because it'll be encouraging to you, because it'll remind you that if you're on God's side, you're on the winning side. And, and of course, during the Days of Unleavened Bread, we reaffirm our commitment to being on God's side. You know, a lot of times people wonder, is God on our side? And the actual question should be, are we on God's side? I want to go to uh, John, the fifth chapter, for just a moment. And um, I'm not going to cover that today, but in John 5 and verse 1, it says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, I actually believe that a very good case could be made that we're talking there about Purim, but that's maybe a subject for another time. So it may very well be that Purim is in the New Testament. Of course, Hanukkah is directly mentioned in John 10. Uh, you can look at John 10, 22 and 23. Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah is directly mentioned, but I think John 5 possibly could be Purim. But today, I want to talk about the, the concept of divine providence and the hidden hand, as it were, behind the scenes that ultimately is controlling events so that things will work out according to God's plan. I want to go to what Paul told the Athenians in Acts 17. He went to the uh, intellectual and cultural center uh, of the world at that time. And he go, and in Acts 17 and verse 26, he says, he, he says of, God, of God, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their uh, pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Oh, so God is, is, in, is, is in ultimately in control and does direct uh, world events. And uh, I want to go now to Matthew 10. <clears throat> and he also, if you have a relationship with God, he will be present in your life, guiding and directing events. In, uh, in John 10, and verse, uh, uh, let's go to, ver Matthew. I'm sorry, did I say John? I'm Okay, good, thank you. Linda's here to help. John, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 10, and I want to go to verse um, uh, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of of your head are numbered, you know, God's omnif omnis omniscient and eternal. He's above time and space. And he's all powerful, omnipotent. He's omnibeneficent. He's all good, perfect good. He's omnipresent. He's eternal. Uh, do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So God knows about you. If you have a relationship with God, he's there for you. He will guide and direct events in your life. You need to develop that relationship with him. Now, uh, I want to go back to uh, the book of Ecclesiastes because in the Hebrew order of the books, uh, the, the traditional Jewish order, Ecclesiastes comes before Esther and Esther is linked to Ecclesiastes. It begins with a copula, it begins with a vav, with, with and. 
uh, and so it's connected to the book before and the book before is Ecclesiastes so I want to go there and see how Ecclesiastes ends because it does tie in with Esther you know the book of Esther in effect shows us what, what goes around comes around the principle of Mida Keneged Mida you know that the uh, more or less the punishment fits the crime so to speak uh, I want to go to the end of Ecclesiastes uh, and it says in verse 13 let us hear the conclusion of the matter fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all for God will bring every work into judgment including every secret thing whether good or evil and the next and then you go right into into Esther and it gives an example of that uh, here we have a plot by Haman. He, he doesn't really let let it let, you know let it, all of his cards out, as it were, to use that metaphor. He doesn't really tell Zer, uh, uh, Ahasuerus uh, his real motive in wanting to destroy the Jews. He makes it seem like there's some threat to the to the stability of the kingdom, to the to the reign of the king, and so on. Uh, you know, but but he had his own. Um, narcissistic ego egoist you know egotistical reasons um, besides perhaps ethnic uh, hatred as well which is an, an uh, perhaps another factor uh, and so he had this secret plot he also had this <coughs> excuse me this plot to, to hang Mordecai uh, and he of course was thwarted he wound up being hanged uh, and uh, and the enemies of the, of the Jews wound, wound up uh, on the losing end but also there are secret things that that go on uh, in the book of Esther. Uh, the, Esther herself, her name, uh, uh, it, it, evidently it's of Persian origin, and she also had the Hebrew name Hadassah, which is evidently you know Myrtle. But uh, a, a person who has a lot of Hebrew background, when he sees the word Esther, he also thinks of the Hebrew root that has to do with being hidden, uh, and so. There, Esther is a book where God is not directly mentioned by name and yet you see his hand in the book you, you, you see divine providence in the book and yet God is not directly mentioned by name uh, and Esther herself for a while hid her own identity as, 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 under the advice of Mordecai uh, and, you know she herself um, did for, for good reasons you know, the Bible tells us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I think that's in that same chapter of Matthew that I was reading. You know, um, I, st I still have it out in front of me. So let me read what, what he says to his apostles here in uh, Matthew ten sixteen. These are the words of Jesus Christ. Behold, excuse me. <clears throat> Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So anyway, that's uh, somewhat of a background to the book of Esther. Now I want to go to a prophecy in Daniel 11. And uh, as uh, Daniel is here being spoken to by an angel, and uh, as the 11th chapter begins, the angel tells him, uh, and in the first year of Darius the Mede, uh, I even I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. Uh, and he goes and, say, and the angel says, And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth will be far richer than them all. We're talking here about Xerxes the first, Xerxes the great, ah, Ahasuerus, or Ahasuerus, uh, there in the, uh, in, in the English translations, Ahasuerus or Xerxes uh, and, and now I will tell you the truth behold three more kings will arise in Persia and the fourth will be far richer than them all by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece so he wanted to uh, try to conquer Greece and his, the fa his failure to do so was probably for the best uh, but he, he attempted to do that he, he was, began ruling in 486 and was assassinated in 465. Of course, we're talking BC. Uh, and there was an attempted assassination much earlier that we read about in the book of Esther. But we see in the book of Esther that he's having these banquets, these feasts for for uh, 
the VIPs of his empire. And it goes on for, for half a year. And evidently, this is a preparation for the, um, for the invasion of Greece, it would seem. He's getting everybody ready uh, for, for this mass invasion of Greece, which ultimately fails. Uh, but anyway, we go to uh, Esther, the first chapter. Uh, now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned uh, over 127 provinces from Eth India to Ethiopia. Now a, a, a Bible, an astute, a student of the Bible reading this would think, oh wow, there's a connection here. Esther is a descendant of Sarah, and Sarah lived to be 127. So you see that, it just hits you, that figure. Uh, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, uh, what is today uh, Iran, then in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persian media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all, uh, and when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan. So he was a good politician. Uh, the, the capital staff the people, many of whom probably were his employees, you know, he made a big uh, a, a dinner for them uh, uh, one more week. The citadel, uh, in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. And it, it describes in detail what when uh, the, the the palace itself so this is not this is intended to be a historical account it's not intended to be an allegory it's intended to be there are a lot of details here it's intended to be a historical account in verse 7 and they served drinks in golden vessels each vessel being different from the other now the jewish tradition is that the uh, these uh, different vessels actually had been taken from uh, the temple in jerusalem back when the Babylonians, when the Chaldean Empire conquered uh, Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. So when in a synagogue a good chanter is chanting the book of Esther, he goes from the Esther mode into the Lamentations mode for some of this, uh, some of this verse. So uh, I, I, I love the uh, chanting and I, I'm kind of a connoisseur of the chanting. So. I, I like to hear one who really knows knows how to do it. So that they'll start out in the uh, Esther mode, and then they'll go for for this part of this into the Lamentations mode. Then, of course, they switch back to the Esther mode. Anyway, and they serve drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. Uh, and in accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory. For so the king had ordered all the officials of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasures. So no pressure, enjoy yourself. Now in the Middle East, in the culture of the Middle East, there's much more of a tradition of separating of the sexes. Uh, this is true in Islam today, it's true in Orthodox Judaism today. And back there we find that there was a separate uh, party going on that the queen was, was, was having. And so we, we look at verse 9, or I do, hope you'll be there, I hope you're there with me. So Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, and evidently uh, uh, the, the Persian Empire, the rulers of that empire, tended to uh, imbibe, uh, let's say they weren't moderate in their drinking habits, which is a negative thing. It's fine to be having wine and 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 uh, you know hard drinks uh, in moderation. It's not good, of course. You know, one should never uh, become drunken, inebriated. That should never happen. Wine, yes. Drunken is no. Anyway, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Bista, Harbona, Bikta, Bikta, Abakta, rather, uh, Zehar and Car and Carcass, seven eunuchs who serves in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown. Now, uh, before I go further, Harbona uh, becomes a hero in the Jewish community if you keep reading the book of Esther. Uh, so, well, well, his name will come up later. Uh, but, you know, this is a very rough situation here. 
history is messy and uh, human beings being what they are things work out for the best but as I said history is is is, is not pleasant to, to, to read about if, if you look at the royal line itself the, the messianic line the line of Jesus Christ you find for example Tamar uh, who let's say she you, you don't know how, how, how she wound up getting pregnant and you see uh, Rahab who has a, 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 a let's say a shadowy uh, past and you see um, Bathsheba uh, and, and Ruth who is a Moabite she converted of course she became a part of the Sinai covenant but she, her background was was among people who were enemies of of, of, uh, of, uh, of Israel and Judah so anyway as I said history is, is rather messy and you know here we have a king who had a harem who had eunuchs uh, and uh, who was plotting an invasion uh, further west you know so this is the reality this is the world as it is so he said uh, let's go what he and what he commands to do in verse 11 to bring Queen Vashti uh, before the king wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials for she was beautiful to behold but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs uh, so here it's interesting if you look at Iran today they seem they seem to, to be really hung up with with uh, keeping women quote unquote in their place to you know it's 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 rather tragic what's going on in Iran now and our women are being treated there now so uh, this seems to be here we have an issue a uh, similar issue here although this is a little bit different you could say that uh, you wonder why she refused if, if she you know it, did, did he ask something extreme of her or or was she just a, an uppity sort of person or what uh, anyway but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs therefore the king was furious and his anger burned within him uh, then the king said to the wise men who understood the times for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice. So at least he did have a, a, a advisors. Uh, to, uh, that, that was that's a positive thing. Uh, those closest to him being uh, Karshena, Seth, uh, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, uh, Maris, Marsena, and Memukan. So see, as I said, you see, this is not written to be allegorical. This is a historical account. Um, otherwise, where did Purim come from? Uh, this gives the explanation of why there is a poor a Purim holiday. Anyway, so it talks about these as the seven princes of Persian media who had access to the king's presence and uh, who ranked highest in the kingdom. What shall we do to Queen Vashti according to law? Because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs. And when Mukin answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women, so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes. When they report, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. Now, as we keep reading, you'll see how in these first two chapters, everything comes into place to prepare for the salvation of God's people later on. You know, he prepares, we have a saying in our, in our community, you know, he prepares the cure before the disease. <clears throat> so here we have everything falls into place before the, uh, before the trouble even starts. Uh, so to save time, <clears throat> let's just say that he puts her away in the sense that he, she doesn't come to him anymore and he, she's no longer going to be queen. In the meantime, you, uh, 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 between 1 and 2, chapter 1 and 2, he's in, he invades Greece. And evidently, while uh, conducting this invasion, he begins to realize, I want to come home to a queen. And so he sends back word, I'm speculating now, based upon my knowledge of chronology, uh, scanty though it may be, you know, that, that he, he, um, he sends back this command uh, to go ahead and and, get, and gather together uh, the, vir the beautiful virgins to prepare so that when he comes back he can then uh, evaluate them and choose a queen and he comes back earlier than he had planned because things are, didn't go well for him 
And so I believe after the Battle of, Salam, Battle of Salamis in 480, he returns, leaves some army behind, but they, they lose further and the invasion is a failure. But he comes back and uh, meantime these versions are being prepared. It takes a whole year for them to be prepared. So he comes back, I think around the middle of that period, and then after a number of months, they begin to come to him and he he makes his evaluation who's going to be queen and again it's 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 a rough situation to when you when you really think about it uh it isn't the ideal it's like plan b but this this is the as i said this is the world uh that we live in uh because of the fact unfortunately there's so much sin in the world but it all works out at least in uh, ultimately for the best in the sense that god's church is preserved and for a while, as people are in a very good position, by the end of the book, things are going quite well for them. So anyway, we, we see here that uh, uh, he, he decides to, um, to gather together uh, the virgins and so on, uh, so he can choose a new queen, beautiful young women. Um, and uh, in Shushan, I'm going to verse 5 now. In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. It gives his background. He's a Benjamite. Uh, and then he has this cousin Esther who who he was taking care of who he adopted as a daughter and um, she was very beautiful now she had the name Hadassah in Hebrew and Esther uh, it's often the case uh, you know I'm Meir David but I, you know I'm Mark David in, in English so I, my first name in, in, in the secular world is different than the Hebrew Mark and Meir do not translate, neither do Hadassah and Esther translate. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm going to go to verse, uh, well I'm going to jump ahead and just real, you know, because you, you, uh, I want to, to be, you know, within the time frame that my, that's normal for, for these messages. So uh, now he, she's taken to the, to the, uh, to the palace and um, and then we want, and and she finds favor there. Um, and now I'm going to go to verse nine. Now the young, uh, let's go, let's go to verse eight. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered in Shushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai the custodian of the women, and she was particularly favored by him. So things are again are working out so that she winds up being choice, being the choice. But notice in verse ten, Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. So there are times, you know, to keep your cards close to the vest, as it were, to use that metaphor. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the uh, of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. And then you can read about how the women were prepared, and 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 I think it, 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 I think the way the way it's worded here, it took a whole year uh, for them to uh, tw uh, to be ready for for the night with the king. There was a movie about the Book of Esther that came out some years ago called One Night with the King, you know, and that that's how how he makes his evaluation. Um, so in in verse uh, in verse uh, thirteen. Um, thus prepared, each young woman uh, went to the king and she was given whatever she desired to take uh, with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went and in the morning she returned to the uh, second house of the women to the custody of, uh, of uh, Shazgaz, the, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go to the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. You know, so you can make, you know, comments on the government at that time, uh, and unfortunately many governments in this day and time. Now, when the turn came from uh, for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uh, uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as her daughter, as his daughter, to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian, the women advised. You know, they had a good relationship, as we see as, as I explained, and you can read earlier. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of the king who saw her. Esther, so Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Teve, in the 7th year of his reign. 
so uh, th this would evidently be uh, late 480 or early 479 um, if I you know because he started reigning in 486 <clears throat> the king loved Esther more than all the other women for she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti then the king made a great feast, the Feast of Esther. It's interesting, this foreshadows actually Purim, as you can read about later, for all his officials and servants. And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. So everything is now in place. However, people have to play their role. You know, the, the God had set things up for them, but now they had to play their role. The people had to fast and, and implied pray fast and pray for the situation. Uh, Esther, uh, Mordecai had to inform Esther and encourage her and, you know, press her to do what she had to do to encourage her, you know, to persuade her. She then had to have the courage to do it. Uh, she risked her life uh, for her people. She, in effect, uh, was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. She was, in effect, as good as dead and resurrected in a sense because she went to the king and, and in those days, if you weren't, if he hadn't sent for you, you could be killed, you know. But he, 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 he was, he. When she showed up, he, he uh, spared her and he loved her, and so in effect, she was almost in effect dead and resurrected. So she risked her life to save her people, and uh, so uh, you. It, there's a famous phrase that I, I hear a lot nowadays uh, in uh, Esther four fourteen, where Mordecai tells her. Um, uh, for if you remain, so he's, as I said, he's persuading her to do what needs to be done, and she does it. She's the heroine of the story, as Mordecai, in, in a sense, is the hero of the story. But behind the scenes, of course, is the almighty, all-powerful, all-loving God directing these events. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from an, another place. So you see, he is a man of faith. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. As I said, that's a phrase that I hear a lot these days. So God has directed events, but people still have to play their role, play their part. And it does take faith. It does take courage. And they had the faith. They had the courage. And the community uh, fasted as well, as you can read about. So it was a, a commu communal effort, an effort by God's church carrying out God's will and he had he had in effect set the table for them and they went ahead and participated and it, it all worked out uh, really wonderfully you know so we, we see in, the, in this book divine providence uh, and yet written in a way in a, in a you could say in a rather subtle way a more secular way but still making that point uh, and I want to uh, conclude this message by going to the eighth chapter of Romans because uh, it ties in with this message of the book of Esther as we approach the Purim season. Uh, and um, I want to go to the 8th chapter of Romans. Uh, and here Paul is speaking of divine providence. And he says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And then he goes on and talks about the trouble that was taking place in his time. You know, Christians were suffering at his time. He, of course, suffered a great deal himself in carrying out his mission. And he quotes from Psalm 44. And then he says in verse 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is certainly one of the lessons from the book of Esther, which I wanted to discuss today, anticipating Purim. All the best to you and yours.